on the Democratic Alliance has published its intent to introduce a private member's bill to Parliament to clamp down on perks and freebies offered uh, to ministers. At the moment, ministers receive VIP protection services up to 700,000 rands for vehicles for official use, coverage of travel costs for official purposes, among other benefits. And over and above this, they're also getting their salaries, which currently sit between 2 and 2.4 million rands a year. We're joined now by Dr. Leon Schreiber, DAMP, as well as UNISA jurisprudence lecturer, Mamet Resibe, to help us in the conversation. You can join us too by sending us uh, your views and your thoughts on 072-110-584. You can tweet us at Newsroom405. Does the handbook, uh, in your view, exist uh, for any particular legislative reason? Or is it just nice to have and therefore it's there because somebody wants to have it in place? We'd like to get your thoughts on that. Good evening, gentlemen, and thank you very much for your time and uh, for joining us uh, tonight up here on In Focus. Dr. Schreiber, you are, of course, bringing this bill, and uh, key to it uh, uh, is uh, the issues that you raise. One being transparency, now the, the whole process is calculated. Uh, two, you're saying there are no legal requirements, for example, for the president to report any changes to the guide. And three, um, uh, the, 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 the whole guide is not regularly reviewed based on, of course, the economic situations that the country goes through. And the ministerial handbook, in your view, is not law. So let's look at that. If it is not law, is there any legislative basis why it exists? Yeah, good evening, Thabo. Um, I think that's a good summary of, of the intentions behind this private member's bill. Uh, perhaps I'll just start by saying you listed those uh, benefits, but um, in addition to that, uh, you may have seen the front page story in the Sunday Times today, uh, which is also based on research done by the DA and showing that uh, up about 2 billion rand has been spent since President Ramaphosa became president on support staff also for ministers. So that's another big ticket item that's made possible by the ministerial handbook. I think the place to begin um, with regards to our private members bill, what we're calling the cut cabinet perks bill, is the fact that our legislative researchers were unable to find a single law, any legal provision that actually says that this handbook may exist. Once we became aware of this, we immediately reported that to the public protector and um, the, the, the PP is currently looking into that particular issue and um, is likely to issue a report on that. But um, it's very clear that there is no law that says there must be such a thing as a ministerial handbook, which means that it's almost by custom that the president has been able to introduce these benefits without any parliamentary oversight, without any accountability to parliament. And that is why we're introducing this private members bill, because... Uh, we believe that these perks are a form of remuneration. It is money that is being uh, used from taxpayers to fund ministers and deputy ministers. And as such, it should be subject to the same transparency and parliamentary oversight that we see with things like ministers' salaries. Um, you know, Tabu, they say sunlight is the best disinfectant. And we believe if we can bring this issue to parliament so that the president is forced to tell us what the costs are, on what basis he's introducing certain perks, that will be key in reining in the spending and making it more reasonable. Yeah. Dr. Zubay, let's bring in your opening remarks. Why should South Africa um, uh, re-look and uh, certainly support this bill that seeks to, to review the perks and freebies uh, for ministers and deputy ministers, if South Africa should at all? Or should South Africa accept that these are... A cost that comes with the, the trade. So these are tools of the trade and therefore are required to be in place. I mean, I've in a previous interview, you know, in this um, station already stated my view that from where I'm standing, ANC has long become, you know, a criminal cartel based on patronage. And, and I think a part of it is that um, the president is doing precisely that at the expense of public fiscals. And I think it is really telling that a government that has been telling the workers to tighten the, uh, to tighten the belt, the workers in the public sector are not getting any increases. Instead, government has imposed wage freezes 
I mean, it has, you know, wrecked a collective agreement for workers, including teachers, nurses, some of the workers that played a very essential and critical role uh, at the time of COVID um, in keeping public services that were essential in us being able to fight and, of course, being able to survive um, that pandemic and so on. So I think um, this you know, new PEX is really just a continuation of a trend that we've seen where, you know, allocation, first and foremost, of cabinet ministries, but also, you know, the privilege that comes with it is really about the patronage to keep the support base um, for, the mini uh, for the president or whoever is in charge of the ANC at any given point in time uh, within particularly the top excellence of the ANC. But I also think that, um, for me, I don't know what the DA is, pro I mean, you know, is, is really um, proposing, but for me, I've not seen really anything different uh, in terms of when you look at what's happening in Western Cape and other councils, for instance, that have been governed by the DA. For me, the workers' movement has had a principle around this to say that public representative should not earn any more than um, an average wage of a skilled worker in the country. And for me, the, um, the use salaries, the perks for traveling, for housing, all of that means the ministers, means the public representatives are insulated from the realities, the brutal realities faced by many working class and poor people. And I think there's a problem with that. Let's look at that, uh, uh, Dr. Schreiber. The, the, the proposal, from what I am reading in your proposal, you are not arguing that they must be scrapped completely. Am I wrong? No, I think that that's an important distinction or, or subtle point here to make. We are not saying that, for example, the president should not have Mahamba and Lopu, you know, the official presidential residence. Uh, we're also not saying that in some particular cases there may be a need for um, security. We understand that there can be situations where that is just justified. What we are saying is that we need a systemic solution to actually make sure that these decisions around when something is reasonable, when something is justified, should actually go to Parliament, like we do with all other decisions where uh, there has to be this kind of calculation. So at the moment, what you have is a secret document. The handbook is changed in secret. As we saw last year, you may recall, Tabo, that there was uh, revelations about the president secretly amending the handbook in April to allow even more free uh, perks and even more staff. Um, so we don't even know when changes are made. It's basically up to the DA to ask questions on a three-monthly basis uh, to find out if any changes have been made. That, we believe, is, is not uh, in keeping with our constitutional democracy. Um, Parliament is the right venue to exercise oversight. And just think for a second, if we have uh, this process which the, bill, uh, the, the DA's bill is proposing, if the, minister, uh, if the president then wants to introduce a particular perk or a particular benefit, that is something that he must then be able to defend in Parliament, where we will ask him, what is the cost? Have you considered the economic conditions? Have you considered other relevant factors? And Parliament actually then becomes the venue where we can see what these perks are and we can uh, prevent a situation where they are implemented and we find out about it six months later. That is really the systemic solution we need uh, so that we are nimble and reasonable, but that we stop the situation of secret perks being introduced that are totally outside of what any reasonable person uh, would accept. Yeah, let's look at what you raise in Parliament. We'll, we'll come to the aids in a moment, but you, 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 you raised the question in Parliament around the, the costing of state-owned residences for ministers and deputy ministers, saying these come down to, to two billion rands. By the way, we did invite Minister Patricia DeLille, and her response to us was that the open letter that she wrote to you is her position on this matter. So we'll read what's coming out of that open letter as her response to this conversation. Uh, she's saying, in my response in the parliamentary question about the value of official residence for ministers and deputy ministers, I responded with information obtained from the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure on the current value of state-owned properties occupied by ministers and deputy ministers. She says, it must be noted that the amount does not mean that nearly one billion was spent on purchasing these residences, as many of them were acquired years ago 
before 2019. Let's start there. That the, the, the figure that you're putting is incorrect because some of them were quite cheap because they were bought quite a long time ago. Well, there's nothing incorrect about it at all, Tabo. The question was, what is the value of the residences? And that is what we indicated uh, once we got those answers. I think the bigger point to make, though, is uh, what is the opportunity cost of maintaining, um, I think it's 97 different um, mansions that are each worth about 10 million rand. The maintenance cost, think about the gardens, think about security, think about all of that. And isn't that something that Parliament should actually be able to say, hang on, the economic crisis in this country means that the billion rand in value, for example, that's locked up in those residences could be spent uh, in a better way or because we are not happy with the standard of performance that we're getting from the executive and perhaps something like a housing subsidy, which would be much more affordable than actually a 10 million rand residence, could assist ministers who are traveling up and down the country. Those are the questions that should really be exercising the minds of Parliament. But at the moment, this whole process, and including everything that Minister Delil talks about, is shrouded in secrecy. It is something where the president has dictatorial powers to decide uh, and then is then implemented like, yeah. uh, by someone like Minister Delil without any proper consideration of the trade-offs, the opportunity cost, and what is actually appropriate at a given time. Yeah. Mr. Sebae, do we need 97 uh, 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 mentions to be maintained by government? Because the minister says, well, this is because of the structure of, 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 of our governance here in South Africa. One, uh, we have uh, the, the seat of, of, of government uh, being in, in uh, 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 is it Pretoria, and, and then we have parliament uh, being in, uh, uh, in Cape Town. And so we've got to have these residences uh, and it's something that we adopted from the past government it's not something that uh, of course this particular administration uh, put in place it is absolutely ridiculous i mean for me it just demonstrates you know how much separation there is you know between the lily who was a trade union you know, you know and working class fighter and you know the bourgeois minister that he is today alongside, of course, Ramapos and others who have really betrayed the struggles of the working class in this country. Firstly, let's deal with the issue of separation of the legislative and administrative capital in this country. It had to do with a fusion into a union of the so-called Boer republics and, of course, British colonies. That history has absolutely nothing and has no meaning for the black majority in this country. All of these entities were nothing more than a, I mean, a slave colonies insofar as, you know, the masses of the black working class are concerned. I do not see why we should be maintaining two separate seats of legislative on the one hand and, of course, of executive power in the first place. And I'm surprised that DA has not been raising that point. But I'm also saying what the DA is not raising in its, state, uh, in its motion, and that's what surprised me, to say, how is it that we are not asking the question? Is really these ministers and politicians in parliament any more important to society and the role that they play than the role that is being played by the nurses who keep our clinics and who keep our hospitals running, who are responsible for our health? Are they any more important than the teachers who teach a future generations of the working class and the people who are keeping this economy going? Are these people any more important than the engineers who are making sure that the telephone lines and everything that we see functioning in society is going on and so on. And that's the reason I've said the principle that has always governed insofar as the workers' movement, at least to which I belong, of course, is that the public representative should earn no more than an average wage of the skilled worker in the country and in the constituencies that they serve. DA is not raising that principle. And I think for me is, you know, um, it, it come across really as cheap political um, point scoring when they themselves, even in the areas where they are governing, in Western Cape, but also their own members of parliament are enjoying this pact. We have a tradition of members of parliament who refuses to take these pacts, and to the extent that they, um, they get paid to them, um, in some instances, I mean, you know, socialist MPs in uh, UK and, uh, you know, in the past, but also uh, I know of councillor, you know, Shama Sawant, uh, a socialist councillor in Saturday in U.S., who is taking, of course, the wage of the average workers in the constituency that said. 
That is not what the DA is raising. And I think for me, it speaks to um, what is it that we need to do. And for me, the perks around security, for instance, right? There is, you know, um, there is just too much security around these ministers, which I think has absolutely nothing to do with their security requirements. Most of it is just an emphasis of, you know, power, of privilege, um, um, the issue around their housing conditions. And this it means that these are people that are completely insulated from extortionate house renters that working class people are facing, who are completely insulated from the cost of living crisis, particularly with the increases in energy, in transport costs, because all of this are borne by public fiscals without any justification in most of the instances. The second break will come back and continue. Dr. Leon Schreiber, uh, as well as uh, Mame Chrissy Bay, staying with us. You can join in the conversation. Let us know what your views are. 072-110-584. Otherwise, tweet us at Newsroom 405. Would South Africa uh, do well to cut down on perks and freebies uh, for ministers and deputy ministers? They argue, of course, that they need these extra numbers of aids and uh, security uh, because they are required to to support them in carrying out particular certain tasks. We'll hear in a moment uh, from Dr. Leon Treber what he makes of the responses that we have been seeing, of course, in uh, today's publications. In Focus continues shortly. Back live tonight on In Focus, looking at the guy, the ministerial handbook, and why uh, it exists, and um, whether indeed uh, we should be bringing it in uh, as law in the country, and what should guide uh, the limits that should be placed in it. Dr. Leon Schreiber uh, is still with us, as well as Mamet Risebe joining us. Uh, also, you can let us in on your view, 072-110-5584. Dr. Schreiber, so you, you have raised this issue around the number of aids, and um, it does seem to be uh, a little bit confusing uh, in terms of the responses that uh, uh, we, we, we are getting here. For example, let's, let's, let's talk about Minister Lamula, who says, uh, there is provision uh, that he is calling upon here that uh, if there is a requirement, uh, you can have what is called coordinators uh, in, 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 in that department that is going to help him with particular aspects uh, of work. Right. So the reason he is saying this, uh, presumably, is because of the expose that the DA um, ran regarding the fact that 
about half of cabinet, I think 12 ministers and 17 deputy ministers, are actually exceeding the number of staff members they are allowed to employ. So when it comes to a minister, for example, they are allowed to have 11 staff members and a deputy minister, seven staff members. This includes positions like household aides, driver messenger, receptionist, all kinds of different supporting roles. And despite this uh, generous provision in the handbook, we have a number of ministers, including Minister Lamola, but also including uh, Gwede Mantashe, Peggy Kele, Moloko uh, Kabai, a number of these who are employing far more. In some cases, like Minister Mantashe, 17 ministers. Now, this clearly exceeds and violates what is provided for in the ministerial handbook. And that is something that we will now be submitting to the public protector as an additional complaint. In other words, we already have a complaint regarding our view that the handbook in itself is illegal because there is no law that allows it to exist. But secondly, even the provisions of the handbook are now being violated by members of cabinet themselves. So that is why you are seeing uh, someone like Minister Lomola trying to justify and explain, but really he's going to have to go and justify and explain himself to the public protector once we've submitted this complaint. I do just want to say that um, it's a very important point that is raised uh, by Mr. Sibe uh, about this insulation of cabinet from the realities of South Africa. Uh, and another example, of course, is load shedding. We saw that um, Minister De Lille also spent 2.6 million rand on buying generators for these mansions, um, and ministers get free water and electricity um, in addition to all of the other perks. He raises the VIP protection. Um, our information shows that it costs 8 million rand per year for every VIP that is being protected. I mean, that is money that belongs in the police budget, not in VIP protection budget. So clearly there is a very serious crisis around the handbook. We have ministers even exceeding and violating the handbook, and that is why we are saying this entire system needs to be reviewed uh, and brought before Parliament so that it can be addressed. Yeah. But the argument is that why not throw away the handbook completely and uh, all professionals uh, in public service must get paid what workers are getting paid. If nurses uh, don't get extra security and bodyguards and free electricity, why should ministers and deputy ministers, MECs, premiers and, and everybody else get that? Look, I, I personally agree strongly with the principle there. I think that there is massive wastage going on. And what we are busy doing uh, through all of the information that we are digging up is to actually try and calculate what is the exact figure, what is the exact amount, what does the ministerial handbook and the cabinet actually cost South Africa. And that number is going to include a massive amount of wastage that must be trimmed. So I agree on, on VIP protection. There's massive changes that need to be made to bring down that 8 million number and in some cases eliminate some of the benefits. I think the same goes for luxury vehicles. Uh, you mentioned, Tabo, at the beginning of the show, it's 700,000. I can tell you the Minister of Finance has changed that in the meantime. It's now gone up to 800,000. So these are all the kind of things that we need to uh, trim back. The only thing I'm saying is that we need a constitutional and parliamentary process to manage that discussion and those changes. So uh, the best way to do this is not to let the president decide, because this is the fundamental problem at the moment. The president has dictatorial powers, and I'm sure Mr. Sebe would agree with me that uh, as long as he can do what he wants, he's not going to address this problem. It must come out into the open. It must come into parliament so that the public can also put pressure on MPs uh, who are then responsible for affecting these changes. That is the systemic solution that we are proposing. We could theoretically have a president who is very enlightened and decides to cut these things tomorrow, but the day after that, someone else can come along and increase them even by 10 times what they currently are. That's because there is absolutely no parliamentary oversight, and that is the systemic problem we are trying to address. Yeah. The limits put on these perks, Mr. Sibe, are clearly... Uh, and not be able to be enforced because, I mean, people can break the, the rules, break the limits, and, and really there is no consequence. What, what do you suggest should be done uh, to put brakes uh, on, on this free reign uh, uh, as far as perks and freebies are concerned? I mean, I've already spoken to the issue of the principle that I don't see how and why. Um, I mean, why should, um, you, know, um, you know, ministers be any more than 
um, other skilled, you know, um, public servants. I've also uh, spoken about, um, you know, the issue of maintaining two residences, uh, and I think that has to be that, uh, that has to do with us abolishing, um, you know, two seats of legislative and uh, you know, and executive power. But I think there are also other issues as well. Um, one of those is that, um, you know, securities, uh, as I said, a lot of it is really unnecessary. We need to say there must be a determination of a security requirement based on an assessment and not this massive interest that you see where, I mean, you know, ministers go around walking like, you know, um, you know, bosses of a mafia, you know, of, you know mobsters um, than really a public servants, right? Uh, but also the issue around housing. We need to ensure that there is a very modest housing. I do not see why we should be having people sitting and staying in mansions. But also some of the cost. Already these are people that are already paid way more than, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, many public servants. Mm -hmm. I do not see why they can't get out the cost of their own electricity and other household and um, costs and other things. However, what been, we uh, so, sorry, let, let me come in here, Mrs. Bay. It's been argued in other instances, for example, in Guazulu Natal, where we saw uh, a, 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 a Morana Commission rather being held, and that lives of uh, councillors, for example, are in, in danger because of the political killings and the political violence, and therefore they do need to have this security around them. But that's why I said that you can make, a, a, you know, a very detailed security assessment and on the basis of that determine whether that person needs a security and what amount of security does that person need. So, for instance, I mean, they're just ministers who, I mean, you wonder who really threatened that particular minister and why do they need a very massive interage around them and so on. None of, most of these security interages have nothing to do with the security requirement. It has to do with an emphasis as I've said, of power, of privilege, and I think for me, that is also the issue of lack of accountability um, that uh, the DA spoke about, to say that I think for me, we need to say this ministerial handbook, I, I can't see why it shouldn't be part of, you know, um, public service bargaining process where there is transparency about negotiations about the conditions of the ministers as well, to say that if the ministers, if the cabinet think Nurses think teachers deserve this amount of salaries. They should be subjected to that, but also their own benefits in terms of these packs should be subject of that very same process. Yeah, so you, you're saying... In addition, of course, to other public consultations. Yeah, is that what you're saying? I don't, you're I don't agree you're, that... You're, you're I, suggesting... I don't agree that you can just leave that to parliamentarians uh, because yeah. they themselves are part of the problem. So don't take it to Parliament. Don't take it via this bill. How else do you bring it as, as, as law of the country? No, I'm saying you can take it through the bill, but it shouldn't be limited there. I'm just saying there should be a process of public consultations where members of public, that is taxpayers, um, and ordinary people of this country have a say in the process. But I'm also saying that I cannot see why should the ministers be insulated from the very public bargaining process in the public service bargaining council where they are telling nurses, where they are telling teachers and other people who are maintaining essential public services that there is no money. Why their condition can be subject to that same process? Yeah, Dr. Shriver, let's take it to PSBC, but uh, not, not, not only uh, that. Tell, tell me about the process that you opened. I think it was up until the 20th of February. I don't know whether you extended it for, for, for public submissions. Yes, again, I think there are some very valuable points there. Um, we should keep in mind that um, any parliamentary process must provide for public consultation. So again, I think you can um, deal with both of these issues once you make uh, it compulsory for, this, for these uh, perks to actually go through Parliament. So you will, by definition, have an opportunity then for public participation. In terms of uh, the bill itself, um, we have had a period of comment on the initial intention to introduce the bill. The next step will be to actually table the draft bill itself. And I would really call on, on all sectors of society. Um, and I would say including uh, public service unions who are currently engaged uh, in these negotiations to, to make input on this bill. Help us refine it. 
make sure that it has uh, the necessary teeth that we require to fix the systemic problem. And I really think even though uh, people may have slightly different views on the exact contents of the ministerial handbook or, or what these things should look like, there is a general consensus that it cannot go on like this, that we are experiencing an extreme level of wastage. Uh, we are creating two societies. It's an insider and an outsider society. Uh, the analogy of people driving around with, you know, eight SUVs and, and, and bodyguards, it does look like a, sort of a mafia boss that's going by, and you've got the blue lights and they're pushing people off the road. I think most South Africans actually agree that all of these kind of things do need to be addressed. What we are saying is we are creating an opportunity. We are opening a door in Parliament here uh, to begin that process, and we would invite anyone who has views on this to make a submission on the Cut Cabinet Perks Bill, and then if we can uh, get public support to actually lobby people to make sure that this does become the law. And I can guarantee you, Atabo, I go back what I said at the beginning, sunlight is the best disinfectant. And once we have this law on the books, we're going to force the president to open up about the costs, about the unfairness, about the outrageousness of so many of these perks, and that is the way the people of the country will actually force them to start changing the system. If we don't do that, if we allow them to keep making these secret changes and to, uh, you know, basically get away without any transparency or oversight, nothing will change. That is why this is an important intervention. Yeah. That is, when we bring it to the Public Service Bargaining Council, is, is, is this go, not going to be a situation of tit for tat where you're saying, well, if you're saying let's cut down on the uh, expenses to security, then surely the workers must also agree to cutting down on certain perks on their side. No, no, no. I mean, the issue for me, um, I mean, um, of, of, of security is a different issue. I'm saying the salaries, uh, the conditions of the ministers should be subjected to that same process. And if we are saying that there is no money for, you know, public servants who are essential to maintaining many of the services that we need to ensure that we have water, we have houses, um, you know, we have health care, we have education, all of that. Those conditions should apply to the same ministers who make decisions about them. We cannot have a situation wherein, uh, you know, a tiny group of people, corrupt politicians, have insulated themselves from the very brutal austerity that they impose on the public service, that they impose on the rest of the working class. And we are saying that if the cost of living crisis, which is faced by the great majority of this country, is to actually be taken seriously, let's expose those same ministers to those conditions. That way you'll ensure that they take an effective measures to ensure that the house renters um, are actually being able to manage. The, the cost of living in terms of the energy base, the yeah. food basket, that is way beyond um, the minimum wages of many workers in and outside of bargaining cancer in this country is addressed effectively. And I think the issue of security upset, that can be based on an objective assessment, not just um, you know, all says fit all and so on. Many of these ministers are not presented with any, you know, uh, life-threatening threats from what I could see. Many of them are barely known by anybody, by the way. And I don't think there is anybody who can say that they need those massive interest that we see. All that probably need is just one driver, and that's it. Minister Jurisprudence Lecturer, Mamet Lesebe, I appreciate your time and thank you for coming on tonight. And uh, DAMP, Dr. Leon Schreiber, thank you very much uh, for coming on uh, tonight. In Focus continues.